Greetings and welcome back. We are in AP Senior English and we are still working with Hamlet Act 2. We find ourselves now in that scene in which Hamlet and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are having some back and forth. Let's point out that this conversation, scene within the scene, starts with some pretty lowbrow humor about calling fortune a slut and all of those kinds of things. And then moving on to talk about nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And then finally, Hamlet's going to tell us a little bit about the way he thinks. And let's put it in your notes. Let's make an observation. This is going to sound, what he's going to say, is going to sound a whole lot like the first soliloquy from Act 1 when he calls the world an unweeded garden. Things rank and growth and gross in nature possess it merely. Uh, the world is untended. Let's point out that this is, uh, this is at bedrock one of the really challenging philosophic ideas of Shakespeare's tragedies. He asks this question, if you'll think about it, Rose and, or, or, uh, Romeo and Juliet now all of a sudden can be seen by, in a completely different way. Shakespeare asks a really intriguing question about the world. Is the world ordered in some way? Is there meaning in the universe? Is there some reason for the events as they happen and transpire? Or rather, is the world basically just a bunch of chaos? Now, those of you who have been raised to believe in a divinity of some kind, God or something else, will report immediately the world is ordered because God made it that way. The world is the world that the Lord has made, to quote a biblical passage. Of course, there's going to be a, another side to this argument that says, that's complete garbage. Somebody made that up to make you sleep good at night. The truth of the matter is, really bad poop happens all the time. And of course, the worst poop in your world that could happen is ultimately your own death. You can't stop that from happening. And because that's the case, there isn't any order in the universe. The universe is totally chaotic. Chaos. Okay? Now, Shakespeare will move back and forth in his plays in this debate. Remember, I told you that one of the great things about this cat is that he asks really important questions and sometimes answers them. Here you're going to hear Hamlet suggest that the world doesn't really have the kind of order and wonder and beauty that everybody wants to give it. He continues by saying about humans, he will, he will say that it's basically the world is a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. In other words, there isn't any beauty in the world. It is nothing more than gaseous chaos. And that's all that it is. But then he starts to talk about humans. What a piece of work is a man, a human being? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on page what? Uh, um, 116. 116 in your, in, in your guys' folio. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason. We're really amazing thinkers. How infinite in faculty. We have tremendous faculties, capabilities of reason, intellectual ability. In form and moving, how express and admirable. When you watch athletes, for example, run the physical body, how beautiful it is. Uh, in action, how like an angel. In apprehension, thought again, how like a god. Put a note to yourself. This is the Renaissance humanist view of humans. Humans are wonderful. Wonder, amazing in every way. Amazing capacities of thought, amazing capacities of physical ex uh, expression. If you've ever watched beautiful dancers or you've ever watched great athletes, roll tight, you've got all of that happening, you see. And yet at the same time, he continues, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, the number one animal of all animals. Let's point out, this is pure Aristotle as well, right? The idea that humans are at the apex in the animal kingdom. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Wow, interesting. After Hamlet says, lots of people want to claim that humans are so absolutely remarkable, they're really nothing more than walking dirt. Which, if you'll think about it, is absolutely true. Because once you die, you ain't nothing but dirt. You're a little bit of water wrapped in dirt. And that's all that you are. And to make something more of it for Hamlet is a waste of time. He says, that's pretty much all you are. Notice he says, man delights not me. In other words, I'm not interested in talking about how superior or remarkable man, man is. Man delights not me, no, nor woman neither. Though by your smiling, you seem to say so. When he says, man delights not me, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern look at each other and go, and he goes, no, no, woman, neither. And then they go, yeah, right. Why? Because Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have been told what? He is 
so depressed, he has gone crazy because of a girl. Yeah, and notice Hamlet will pick up. Why did you laugh? Why did you laugh when I said, man delights not me? Uh, Rosencrantz will say, no, 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 that's, that's not it at all. He says, mm, it's the actors. They say the actors have come. Immediately, the guy playing the character, playing Hamlet, will become unbelievably animated when he hears that the actors have arrived. And look what he says. He that plays the king shall be welcome. And of course, the audience understands this is not the ravings of a madman. He's going to immediately insult his own uncle Claudius by saying, Claudius is not a real king, he is an actor. Onto the stage will come the actors. There will be this brief interlude, and I promised you that I would have a little bit to say about this. Shakespeare often did this. If there were things actually happening in the London stage of his day, he would inject those kinds of political observations into his plays. There was a, a brief period of time in London, on the, in, in the stage district, in the theater district, where young children were being put together as acting troops, and they became kind of like the phenom of the day, if you will, Young, uh, young men who like to stand on stage and sing, if that's what you wish to call it, and lots of people going nuts over it, buying tickets and the like to go and witness it and all of that, you see. Uh, that, <laughs> phen that, phenomenon, that phenomenon is not a new one, it's a very old one, and it was happening during Shakespeare's day, and nobody wanted to go watch Shakespeare plays anymore, they wanted to go watch the Justin Bieber of the day. And uh, Shakespeare stabs, gets a little stab or a jab in here by saying, the actors, he asked the actors, you're a great group. Why, why are you outside of the city? And they say, well, we got no work. What? You're like the best actors. What do you mean you got no work? Oh, no, back in the city, all the idiots back there care about is some kids standing on stage squawking and squealing, and they call it singing. You see, kind of get the drift here. And so, and so now we're stuck having to go around the country to make a living by doing this acting thing. Interestingly, it will be for Hamlet that he will request a certain passage from Virgil's Aeneid. It's significant that we outline this for your notes. Shakespeare will assume his intelligence audience already knows this passage that's being referenced. What is that passage? Well, we're told when Aeneas escapes from Troy and he falls in love with Dido, he tells Dido the story of the fall of Troy. We're told that there's tremendous chaos. Everyone is being killed. The city is now on fire. Smoke is everywhere. Old man Priam, the king of the city of Troy, and his wife Hecuba try to run through the city to get away. They look up and they see one of the greatest of the Greek warriors. His name is Pyrrhus. We're told that Pyrrhus is completely covered in blood and guts. He's a huge man. He is enraged that he's had to wait 10 years to be able to get inside his city and slaughter all these Trojans who he hates. He's completely covered in blood and guts. He's got this huge sword that's just covered in blood and guts because he's just been, he's killing anything that moves. And we're told he's so enraged that his eyes are red. For those of you who are Terminator fans, you kind of know the, 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 the uh, origin now of that story. His eyes are red, and he sees old man Priam, and he screams at him. And we're told old man Priam, like a rabbit, freezes and then runs uh, quickly to get away from Pyrrhus. He turns down a one-way street that becomes an alley that is a dead end. And at the dead end, old man Priam and his wife Hecuba are sitting there as Pyrrhus turns and starts walking towards them. For those of you that play these violent video games, now you kind of get the sense. As he's walking down with his sword, old man Priam, we're told, falls to his knees and starts begging for his life. Hecuba starts to cry, Moblid, weeping silently, behind him, begging for his life. We're told that Pyrrhus raises his sword, comes down right on top of his head, but doesn't cut his head open. He pauses for a moment. The entire city of Troy goes completely silent, we're told. And one final thought goes across the brain of old man Priam about a night, many years before, when his wife Hecuba gave birth to a young infant. And into the room came the blind prophet Tiresias, who said, if you don't kill that kid, your entire city will be destroyed, and you along with it. You'll remember, of course, that kid was named Paris, and of course Paris ends up being the reason that these Greeks are in fact inside of the city of Troy. And then of course, old man Priam's head is split open like a cantaloupe. His wife Hecuba is taken off to be raped and pillaged and killed. That is the story Hamlet requests to hear from these actors. 
That is the story. Jot down in your notes why. Why would Hamlet, of all of the potential stories that he could ask to have recited by a group of actors, why would he ask for that set of lines? Any ideas? Anyone want to take a stab at this? Killing the king. Clearly we got regicide happening, right? The killing of King Priam. I don't understand, so what? So it kind of mirrors what he wants to do. Okay, good. So it mirrors what Hamlet wants to do. But wait a minute, it also mirrors what... Himself. That's right, it also mirrors what Hamlet already has had happened, right? The killing of a king. <coughs> Better, you should have killed me instead of my father. Good, there's going to be that, right? The idea, the Did idea... Of, that's right, idea. The idea of I'm coming after you, very much. It's, tell, it's reminding the audience, Hamlet has a mission. That mission has been given to him by his ghost father, and Hamlet hasn't forgotten that that's the mission. That's significant because we're into about an hour and 20 minutes of the play by this point, and it's easy for audience members to go, dude, when's this guy going like, to get on to the killing part of this? That's why we're here. We want to watch him jack Claudius, that kind of thing. Well, you've missed it. What else? Go back to the first soliloquy. What is it Hamlet's most mad about? His mom. His mom. Frailty, thy name is woman. Keep going. He points out something in this recitation of these lines. In fact, Polonius even catches on it. Moblid, Moblid is good. He says about old far Polonius, Polonius doesn't like real stories. He only likes that kind of stuff where there's uh, sex and stuff like that. That's what he says about Polonius. Polonius isn't for a real, he's for a body tale. Uh, and then... The Mobley Queen, Plato says, oh, that's good, that's good. What about Hecuba? <clears throat> Why would Hamlet be so interested in Hecuba? How does Hecuba respond to the killing of the king? What does Moblid mean? Silent. Really sad, really silent. She clearly loved her king. What's Hamlet suggesting about his mom? My mom right, my mom's got no grief. She doesn't care about the passing of my old man, and she's gone off and married that... Yeah, soft, 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 kind of thing. See how it works. <clears throat> Finally, to finish Act Two, Hamlet will request the murder of Gonzago be played. This is a famous play, <clears throat> and he asks if he can write some lines that he's going to inject into the play, and then he's going to invite his uncle, father, to come and watch the play. And uh, they say, "Yeah, sure, I can do that for you." And the play, uh, the players then will leave. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern will leave, and now we are to that famous soliloquy of Hamlet's where he will say, now I am alone. I want to look at that soliloquy now together, so you want to have some notes in front of you. And I want to, I want to work uh, line by line in the same way that we worked with Act One soliloquy. But before I begin, I want to point out again to you the power of the soliloquy for Hamlet. Some of you, I realize, are just reading plot summaries of the plays you're AR testing over. Others of you are just reading plot summaries and watching a performance, but some few of you are actually reading these plays in some detail. And as you read these plays, I want you to begin to understand the power of Shakespeare often resides in his soliloquies. When he leaves a single character on stage and you get to kind of hear what that character's thinking is all like, gives us a psychological profile, if you will. Freud loved the play Hamlet. He said that the play Hamlet told us a whole lot about the human psyche and how it's possible for us to behave in certain ways because of motivations that are, Freud would call them, unconscious. We're unaware of what it is that makes us behave the way we behave. For example, or, you know, we, can, we can use a present day example. Um, you see someone sitting there at lunch. They're just sitting there, calm, collected. You watch someone walk up to them and say one or two words to them, and all of a sudden that individual goes, Whoa! and you're watching all this. Well, you have to deduce that that Whoa! was already there in that still silent person who was just sitting there. It was just waiting for the right moment to explode. Well, why? What was going on in that person's mind? See, that's a very modern question. In the time of the Greeks, they didn't really ask a question like that. 
That's a very modern question. Freud made that question for us a natural question. What's going on in his or her mind? What was she thinking about? What were her motivations for behavior? Why, for example, would someone do crazy things like go and kill a bunch of people or whatever? And often the, question, the observation is, he was a pretty normal guy. He's like quiet, very reserved, and sat in his house and played Halo or whatever. I don't even know what, what, why would he do that? What motivates our behavior? Shakespeare's soliloquies gives us an insight into human psychology. Let me give you an example. We now have young Hamlet. He's standing alone on stage and he will say, now I am alone, which means two things. He's alone physically, but it might also mean that for the first time, Hamlet recognizes his existential isolation, his aloneness in that regard. The great Russian writer Dostoevsky, of course, will write Brothers Karamazov in many ways as a response to the play Hamlet and seeing this play as such a powerful statement of the existential loner, that individual who is completely alone. He has no one. He has no one. Okay, he's completely alone physically, but he has no one. Notice the next thing he says. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. He begins to insult himself. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage wane, tears in his eyes, distraction, its aspect, the broken voice, his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit? He says about the actor he just witnessed who if it's done well, that actor gets really emotional about the death of Priam and the Moglid queen Hecuba. So much so, Polonius points it out, that he has tears in his eyes. He's an actor. He can act well. He can get so into the part that he literally has tears in his eyes. And Hamlet's like, it's monstrous. He can act like that. It's completely acting. And for nothing, for Hecuba, keep going. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba? That he should weep for her. What would he do? Had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? It's really interesting. A care, an actor is playing the role of Hamlet. Talking about another actor playing on stage the role of an actor. Notice all the circles within circles here. And Hamlet says about that actor, if he knew my life, he would really have a reason to be sad, to be worked up, right? I mean, Hamlet will point out, my life is clearly very distraught. By the way, let's point out as well, it seems almost like Hamlet is identifying in some way with the plight of Priam and the plight of Hecuba. He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. If this actor knew what was going on in my life, he would weep so much that the stage would be full of tears. It's kind of dramatic, right? When we talk about over-drama, over-melodramatic, we sometimes reference this scene, right? Hamlet is one upset boy. If you've ever gone in your room because you were mad, and you started throwing things and screaming out loud and talking to yourself because you were really mad, you're in this moment with Hamlet. This is Hamlet. Shall we say it out loud? Hamlet is throwing a little temper tantrum that's going to grow into a bigger temper tantrum, okay? He begins by pointing out, this actor got all worked up and he's got no reason to get worked up. I have a reason to get worked up. Keep going. Yet I, look what he says about himself. He beats himself up. Yet I, a dull and muddy-meddled rascal, peak like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. And then there's the dash. No, not for a king, upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. And then all of a sudden he pauses. He literally looks out at the audience, and he asks the audience, am I a coward? Who calls me villain who insults me? Breaks my pate across, slaps my face, plucks off my beard and blows at my face in Shakespeare's day. If you really wanted to insult someone, you walked up, because all men wore beards. You walked up to his beard, you literally pulled hair out of the beard, and you blew it back into his face. It wasn't the pain of the hair coming out of the chin that was the insult. It was the blowing of the hair back into the face. This was proof text that some kind of a duel had to be fought to show that a major insult. Hamlet says, who has done this to me? Who has insulted me in some way? Gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does this, huh? 
Swoons, he says, I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. What's he just said? Put it in your own words. I'm teaching you how to read here as we read. Don't rely on that crap on the other side of the page. Try and figure it out for yourself. What has he just said? What's he said about himself? I am, what's it mean to be pigeon-livered? I'm a wimp. I'm a total coward. I'm a wimp. Why would he say this about himself? Right. His father has been murdered. He's been told to get revenge. And yet, he's done absolutely nothing. Right? He's done nothing. He says, Or ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful. I should have killed the way Pyrrhus kills. Hamlet will identify that he is no Pyrrhus. He is no great, great Greek hero, heroic warrior. He is not a fighter. He is not a killer. If you will, he is a Paris. He's a lover. He's no fighter. And we kind of get this sense from Hamlet. He's this really kind of sensitive scholar type. He's not this, let's go kill. Yay, I get to go jack. No, not at all. Then he starts to really, and I mean, if you see this done on stage, this is a pretty powerful scene. This starts out Hamlet beating himself up. And then it gets to a point where he just starts screaming the next lines. Look at it. Bloody, body, villain. I think we got to get what that means. But the obvious question is, who's he talking about? Remorseless, treacherous, uh-oh, lecherous, kindless, villain. Whoa, who could he be? And by this point, when he screams, oh, vengeance, it's loud. It will reverberate all around the theater when he screams, oh, vengeance. Now, we understand vengeance here will mean to get back for a foul deed. Obviously, we're referencing the death of his father by Claudius. Who is the villain that he's talking about here? What are the options in your mind? Clearly, Claudius is one. You got any others in mind as candidates to be a villain that would be remorseless, wretch, treacherous? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so, so we got Hamlet clearly having problems with mommy dearest. And he will scream, oh, vengeance. And uh, usually he'll hold his head. He'll grab his head like he's, you know, he's losing him. And it's at this point you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is this kid faking like he's crazy or actually crazy? You're maybe familiar in the Second World War with the laws regarding the capture of British soldiers. When they went to German prisons, as long as they were officers, they were given the opportunity to return back to Britain if and only if they were insane, if they lost their mind. The British soldiers, officers, began a process of faking insanity. They'd act crazy. The Germans would say, oh, they went nuts. War has a tendency to do this to people. Put them on a plane, fly them back to England. We don't want to have to mess with them. They'd walk off the plane and they would say, right, let's get back to work. Snap right back to it. Faking insanity and then immediately coming right back to sanity, right? But we have other stories, and these are the tragic ones, of the officers and the Germans caught on to this after a while, and they, got, they, they started making them go through a series of tests, psychological battle, uh, battery tests, to make sure that, in fact, the person was insane and not just faking it. And there are a number of stories of guys, officers, who actually fooled all of the German psychologists, got off the plane, walked off the plane, and said, all right, let's go back to work. As soon as the, as soon as the Germans handed them over, their whole persona, everything changed, and they went from looking crazy, being crazy, to back to sanity again. All right, let's go back at it. But there are other stories of the officers who show up, and they're gone. They're gone. They're, the, mentally, they're not sane anymore, and they remain insane for the rest of their lives. They literally lost their minds by choice. They told their pals, I'm going to fake crazy, so that I can come back, uh, but they never came back. Question, and it's an intentional question at this point, has Hamlet kind of lost it? And there is a huge debate about this. Some scholars will say it's at this point that we figure it out. Hamlet's not faking crazy. He's not taking on an antic disposition. This kid's actually crossed the line, and he's lost it. At this moment when he screams, oh, vengeance. And then he does something very interesting. He says, oh, vengeance. 
And then he steps away for a second and he kind of almost like looks back at himself. It's almost like he does one of these. Oh, very nice job. That's very nice acting. Good job. And he becomes very kind of clinical, logical, precise. And he says, what an ass am I. This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing, a very drab, a scullion. And then it's at this point that he'll grab his head. He uses the F word. And he will say, fie upon it, fie, which is, of course, the exact same phrase that he used in the first soliloquy. That is to say, he's losing it. And then all of a sudden he pauses. He'll look right at the audience. And the audience, again, I tell, I'm telling you, if you're a good actor and you play this role, it can be really freaky. Because one moment, you're completely insane. The next moment, you're so rational, you can have a conversation directly with the audience. And he will say, about my brain, earlier he called it a distracted globe, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions for murder, though it hath no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. He says, I have heard that a criminal watching a performance of a play, when a certain thing happens, the criminal actually pronounces his guilt by virtue of watching the performance on stage. In other words, the play is almost like a mirror where he sees his actions reflected back to him. Of course, for the thinking ones in the house, you're already jumping at 3A to Aristotle's poetics. You'll recall, that's what he said great drama does. Remember our conversations about Oedipus Rex and Antigone. To actually look into the play allows you to have a reflection back, and it's in that moment of reflection that catharsis happens. Remember Aristotle arguing this in poetics for us, right? That purgation happening because of fear and pity and all of that. Hamlet will say, I'll observe, uh, uh, um, he says, I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks, I'll tempt him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. And then he says something very fascinating. The spirit that I've seen may be the devil, his father. The spirit that I seem may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy. Hamlet willing to admit that he's in a depressive state. As he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. He says, I'll have more grounds, I'll have grounds more relative than this. In other words, Hamlet is beginning to doubt the very fact that his father has told him, I was killed by my brother. And then finally, Ham, uh, Shakespeare always likes to end his acts with a rhyming couplet. Right? Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. The last lines of the first act. Here, notice, uh, the play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. What does that mean? He's going to use the play to determine. You got it. I'm going to use the play to catch my uncle as in a trap later when his uncle asks him what this play is. The audience knows what the name of the play is. What's the name of the play? The, Do you remember it? He asks him, murder of Gonzaga, right? But when the king, Claudius, asks Hamlet, what play is this? Hamlet doesn't say the murder of Gonzaga. He rather calls it the mousetrap. Oh, it's called the mousetrap. That's what he'll call the play. Uh, again, the ability to kind of capture or trap. We now end the second act. We're ready for the third act. And nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. Words, words, words words. And we just finished another soliloquy where we get to hear more words, words, words. And yet, let's do a quick psychological profile of this kid. Jot it down in your notes. If Mr. Staub was brought in to try to psychoanalyze this cat and had to do some kind of brief profile on him, what would you say about Hamlet at this point? What would you say about his emotional, psychological state? Is it, is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? Teetering on the brink, could go either way. Is it a good plan, do you think? And why does he need a plan at all? Why doesn't he just walk up and stab the old man and get done with it? There's multiple answers to this question, by the way. Why doesn't he just do that? Why didn't he just walk up to Claudius and say, you're, you're an SOB, there, done. His mom, mom clearly loves Claudius. Every time she's with him on stage, she's always like ooing and aahing over him. So he clearly knows. You already said, though, that he's, he's like, it's not in his demeanor, maybe, to do it. It would be like if most, we would hope, most guys that you know 
They're not inherently hoping to commit violence on someone. Yeah, I get to kill somebody. And then all of a sudden they're told by their father's ghost, you got to go kill somebody. This is not how Hamlet's hardwired. And to that degree, it could be really messing with his mind that he's got to go off and kill. Wait a minute, who is Claudius? Not only his uncle, Claudius is the king. The repercussions are immense. What are the immediate repercussions of killing a king? Yeah, it's a, it's a suicide act. He's not going to live. He's got to die. How, um, of course, how does he validate the killing of Claudius? See, this is the problem. He's got no way to validate it. It's not like he can go, my father's ghost told me. So he's going to use the play. Right. He's going to use the play to demonstrate the murder. He's going to have a man dressed as a king walk out and lay down and take like a, a fake nap. He's going to have another guy dressed with a black hood come in with a vial. And the guy's going to say, this is poison. And then the guy's going to pour it in the sleeping king's ear. The sleeping king will then grab his head and roll over dead. For anybody watching, they're going to be, whoa, that's a, that's a strange way to kill somebody. But for the murderer who's done it, if he's done it, Notice what Hamlet says. I'll watch his face, the king's face. I'm not going to watch the play. I'm going to watch his face. While the king's watching the play, I'm going to watch the king. Wait a minute. For those of you who, who love acting, there's a reason why actors all love this play the best. You can't hardly find an actor who doesn't claim this is their favorite play, and there's a reason. Because it forces us to think on multiple levels. If you're an actor, you're immediately asking this question. How will I perform this on stage so that the audience watching the play can watch the audience watching the play. Hamlet, the king and queen, Ophelia, will be watching this play. But we, the audience, will be interested in not only what's going on in the play within the play, we're really interested in watching the faces of, for example, Gertrude. Why would we be interested in watching Gertrude's face? Because he was involved. Right. Right? She, she's going to be watching this. If she has any involvement in the, in the development of the plot to kill the king, clearly she might respond as well. Of course, Hamlet's assuming something, that Claudius is going to give it up. What if, what if Claudius is a really good criminal? That would be defined by his ability to control his emotions in the moment and go, oh, that's a strange way to kill somebody. Whoa, who would ever think about doing something like that? That's amazing, Right? We will, we will want to watch multiple things happening. So, Act 3, you can set this up for your notes. Act 3 will set us up already to begin to get ready for the moments that will happen in Act 3. We assume that we will finish Act 2 and we will find ourselves then immediately starting the play within the play. Wrong. Wrong. Are you ready for this? We finish with the soliloquy of Act 2, Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And within not even 50 lines, we're going to hear the most famous lines ever written in the English language, to be or not to be. That is the question. The soliloquy for Act 3 will happen at the very beginning of Act 3 and therefore has to be kind of seen in com companionship to the soliloquy of Act 2. When we come back to Act 3, then we'll begin, we'll want to pay attention to the sequencing and the movement and the timing of Act 3. It sits in the middle of the play. Anytime you study Shakespeare, for example, Tempest, you want to pay particular attention always to the third act. The third act will always be the significant act in a Shakespeare play. It sits right in the center of the play, and you always want to pay attention to the way it's kind of like the hinge act, okay? And it, that will definitely be the case in this uh, most famous of plays, to be or not to be. That is the question. We'll come back tomorrow to, the to that soliloquy of Act 3. Thank you.